It's ever been quiet when I stood at the podium. It's amazing. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm happy to be back again. Um, I'm excited to welcome you all back uh, for day two of three. And this morning, we're going to begin with our prayer, and then we have a special guest who's going to introduce our speaker this morning. So if uh, Monsignor Liddy can come up for our opening prayer. <laughs> Matt rolls me out for the prayer. <laughs> anyway, we thank the Lord for bringing us together. This is really what a university is all about. People from various disciplines coming together, learning from one another, learning from our speaker. So we ask the Lord, Holy Spirit, God, be in our spirits. Help us seek the true and the good the loving. Bless us, bless our speaker in a special way. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. Uh, when I started last year, um, one of the first questions I asked Greg is, well, what, what exactly do we do? Um, and he said, well, Monsignor Lee, who founded the center, 25 years ago. One of the biggest things that the center has done is, is faculty development and faculty formation. And Greg harps on the fact that, yes, we have students for four years, but if you engage with faculty, you can affect the lives of students for 20, 30, 40 years at an institution. Um, and it's true, as faculty, um, I have to say you because I can't include myself right now, uh, because I don't teach. I have, but I don't right now. Um, so as faculty, you never know the impact that you have um, on a student or on someone like me who walks into a university to work um, and to be a part of this Catholic intellectual tradition. And you never know who may come back into your life 20, 30 years from now. I'm not going to say what I was doing 30 years ago, um, but I probably was learning about simple machines and um, having more embraces in science class. But um, I, I, I want to say that you, you, you don't know. You don't know who you're going to impact. Um, and so it's, it's a privilege to be a part of something that has such a long-lasting effect um, at this university. Uh, speaking of, you never know who will come back into your life. We have a former colleague and I believe former student of uh, Dr. Principe, Dr. Eric Hill, one of our professors here in the biology department, who will introduce our speaker. Good morning. Uh, it is my distinct privilege to welcome Dr. Prince Faye to see you all again. My name is Eric Hill. I'm an assistant professor in biological sciences here at uh, Seton Hall. I earned my bachelor's degree in chemistry uh, 20 odd years ago from Johns Hopkins. Uh, when I told my fellow uh, Hopkins graduates that Dr. Prince Faye was seeking here this week, I got texts of, no way, shut up. <laughs> You're so lucky. Uh, and the reason why is because if you look uh, deep down Dr. Principe's CV, you will find that he was professor of the year, uh, I believe twice. This is getting into folklore. OK, just once. <laughs> uh, as we're seeking a folklore today, this is the folklore of a former professor. Um, but again, even 25 years on, his former students still finally remember the excellent instructor we have here today. Uh, my wife was one of the students. I met my wife at Johns Hopkins. Uh, she had a different connection. She got to have you for two of your classes. She took you for Orgo, and she also took you for the history of science and religion. Uh, with serendipity or coincidence, my wife lived on the street in Glenridge, uh, down the road from your some a family member. Yes. Uh, so you wrote her a letter of recommendation to go to grad school. Uh, she didn't make it to med school, but uh, it was an empty thing. Uh, but the letter still um, was there. Uh, speaking of CV and folklore, the one thing that is absent from your CV is that for a brief time, and this this may have been off the books, I don't actually know what was going on at the time, uh, Dr. Principe was the chief science advisor for a dot-com startup called SciTutor.com. <laughs> Wow, I didn't think anybody knew about that. <laughs> it is not in your CV, and I don't know. This is the brainchild of David Klein, who is a professor also at uh, Johns Hopkins, a uh, lecturer, a fellow protege who followed you. Um, 
SciTutor was one of my first jobs out of college. I was a scientific writer, and uh, the interesting thing is dot com, this is around the turn, I'm dating myself now, around the turn of the century. Just uh, the bubble burst. That was part of it. Dave had probably maxed out his credit cards um, to get this thing off the ground, and he was on the phone with different events, investors at different times. We were in this uh, gothic mansion yeah. in the side of Baltimore, and we had late night meetings, and Dr. Prince Pei came in, and he would, uh, he was our advisor. We would watch the videos, we would edit them, we would tell us things. And one of the nights we're sitting around, and this gets into the folklore of Dr. Kunzbe, who I, again, my wife had him. I did not have him, I had Dr. Poland and Dr. Yarkini. So I was, I didn't have you as a student, but here, working with you at SciTutor, um, we had these backroom meetings, and late at night, and David was trying to get investors. So he was, you know, on the phone, we were waiting for him. And you, at the time, took one of these dry erase markers. Now, this is the folklore of accounts. <laughs> you proceeded, now this story I, I've told to others, my wife was like, if you tell us about any other faculty doing this, I would not believe it. <laughs> but because it was you, she's like, no, two PhDs, this is something. You took the cap off him, you know, xylene, a little bit of toluene. Like, you, were, you could tell the chemicals, <laughs> and that's the, the experience of the geometry professor. So it's part of the, the folklore, and today we're talking about folklore. Um, my wife does call you Dr. Dr. Prince of Hayden. In those meetings at SciTutor, you introduced yourself as Larry. So uh, it is again my great privilege to welcome Larry Prince of Hayden to speak today. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Wow, you brought me back down memory lane. I really, um, yeah, SciTutor was quite something, particularly since uh, um, I'm a technophobe usually. Um, I did get involved with the dot com company, which I don't know, maybe I put it out of my own mind. <laughs> um, right, okay, so thank you again. Thank you for coming back a second day. So apparently, I didn't say anything too off putting. Um, and today we're going to do something a bit different. We're going to change gears. We talked yesterday about the origins of the um, idea of a conflict between science and religion. So that was our historiographical day. Today we're going to do a historical day and look at some historical issues um, that will walk fly in the face of the conflict thesis. Um, and I thought where I would start was with Galileo, because it's such a good story. Um, I often say to my students, it's like a soap opera, what happened with Galileo. It's not like a soap opera, any sort of soap opera, it's like an Italian soap opera, <laughs> which is even more complicated and unexpected. So I think what I'm going to try and do, I, the title I gave for today's this morning's talk is Complexity of Science and Religion, the Example of Galileo and Astronomical Novelty. So I, I think one of the messages to take away from this is about how complex the relationship between science and religion has been over time. It cannot be summarized in just a few words. Uh, all of these things are, I would say, complex. So of course, the reason to do Galileo is that what scholars call the Galileo affair um, uh, often comes to the fore very quickly whenever anyone talks about science and religion. Oh, well, look what happened to Galileo. Um, I'll tell you what, start with one actually kind of funny story. I mentioned to you yesterday my good friend um, John Brook, work on uh, natural history you'll be reading. He was the uh, professor of science and religion at Oxford University for his retirement. Anyway, he was asked to come and give a talk, an interview on science and religion with an Irish radio program. And, you know, the light went on, they were on air. The interviewer said, so you want to talk about science and religion? Well, we all know that Galileo was burned at the stake for saying the earth was round. And poor John sat there and thought, where do I even start with that as the introduction? There's so many things wrong with it. I have no idea. So um, that, that again is sort of the folklore of what people are thinking and what has to be corrected. 
So I'm going to try and recontextualize the events that happened in the so-called Galileo affair, and we'll talk about what they actually mean, what's going on. So sort of get ready to hear about a lot of characters and a lot of strange things happening. Um, I've broken it into three sections. Um, first, I want to talk about the scientific background to Galileo's astronomical claims. Uh, then we'll go into what is sometimes called Act One, or the first phase of the Galileo Affair that runs from 1613 until 1616. And in a lot of the popular representations of Galileo, it's not recognized that there were actually two distinct episodes. So in the third part, I'll talk about the second act, or the second phase, which occurs uh, some 20, uh, 15 years later, 1632 to 1633. Okay, so let's begin with the background. So we need to go back to 1543. In 1543, Nicholas Copernicus published his De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium on the revolutions of the heavenly orbs. And this work made bold claims about the structure of the universe in conflict with the prevailing system that had been presented by Ptolemy and Aristotle that was the standard scientific view of the universe. The chief claims were two. One, that the sun, not the earth, was at the center of the universe. So that's heliocentrism, sun at the center. Two, that the earth was in motion, annual motion around the sun. So a moving earth, geokineticism, to use the $40 word for that. And the earth was given two motions. One, a diurnal motion, rotation in once in 24 hours, and an annual motion once around the sun in a year. So Copernicus had been working on these ideas for about 30 years <coughs> by that point. Um, already in 1514, he had written a short summary of his ideas. He didn't publish it, but it circulated in manuscript, and it gave him enough notoriety that Pope Leo X invited him to come to Rome to help in a very pressing problem the church was facing at the time, that is the reform of the calendar. Um, the old Julian calendar that had been set up uh, in the first century BC had gotten wildly off, um, uh, out of sync with the heavenly motions, and so there were serious problems about calculating the correct date of Easter, that's dated from the birth equinox. Um, Copernicus declined to go to Rome because he said he still didn't know with sufficient precision the length of the solar year. Now, Copernicus was a very busy man. He was a canon uh, in the cathedral in, in, um, in Krakow, um, a largely administrative office. He didn't really want to publish his work, in part because he was so busy he didn't have time, this sounds very familiar to any professor, didn't have time to put it into a reasonable uh, form, and he thought people are going to think this is just crazy. However, there were a number of very notable churchmen, um, uh, one Polish cardinal and a local bishop, who said, look, we'll, your work is so important, we will pay for a copyist and a secretary to get it into order and to have it published. And Copernicus is like, I'm really too busy, leave me alone. Um, eventually, Copernicus passed off the work of publication to other people, but um, in fact, he died just about the time it was being printed. There's some story that he may have gotten a copy of it as he was on his deathbed. It's too close to tell. We don't actually know. So eventually it was published in um, 1543 with a dedication to Pope Paul IV. When it was published, his ideas found very little acceptance and for a lot of good reasons. Um, there is a moving earth. Do you sense the earth moving under our feet? Certainly not. So it violates common sense. It violates the entire superstructure of physics of the day. Why do heavy bodies fall? Because they're heavy and they're falling towards the center of the universe. That's why the Earth is spherical. It's centered on the lowest part of the universe and everything falls in that direction. But if somehow, if you could take the Earth, move it from the center, away, for, away uh, hanging in space, away from the center, why do bodies still fall towards it? Why don't they fall towards the sun? So it's violating all these kinds of problems. Also, Copernicus's system um, should have been provable by certain observable phenomena. As the Earth goes around the sun, 
you should get stellar parallax. That is, the distance between certain of the fixed stars should change because you're looking at it from a different vantage point on different sides of the orbit. But people looked for this and no one could find it. In fact, um, we can see stell stellar par uh, parallax, but um, telescopes were not good enough to detect it until the 19th century. Um, so, so the objections against Copernicus's system were so compelling that for the next 50 years, there were probably only a dozen convinced Copernicans. Many others, however, adopted Copernicanism as a convenient fiction. Why? Because when you put the sun at the center, you reduce the number of calculations you need to do to figure out where the heavenly bodies will be in the sky. It makes the calculations easier. So a lot of people started using Copernicus but without believing that it was literally true. And this divides um, what the philosophers call uh, two kinds of theories, realism and instrumentalism. If you're a realist, you believe that your scientific theories are the absolute correct version of what's going on out there in the world. If you're an instrumentalist, you don't care so long as your theory gives you the right answer to something you're trying to find out. And we can talk about that later. I think modern scientists like to think they're realists, but generally are instrumentalists. Um, for my part, as a chemist, oh, I am such a realist. What I tell my students is about chemistry is absolutely true. When they ask me questions about why are things that way and I have to decline into physics, I couldn't care less whether the physics theories are true or not. They give me the right answer for chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> so think about that where science, that's going to come back in a few minutes. Okay, so that's the first part. Now Galileo. Early on, Galileo was not a Copernican. By 1600, the early 1600s, he had, however, become convinced that Copernicus was right. When in 1610, he built a telescope and turned it on the heavens, uh, he became convinced that Copernicus was, in fact, correct. And he then spent time trying to create a new physics that would tolerate the idea of a moving Earth. Because essentially, once you put the Earth in motion, you have to throw out all the physics that you've got from Aristotle and start over. Well, one of the earliest hints of concern about Copernicus arose at a breakfast in December of 1613. Galileo wasn't there, but one of his students, the Benedictine priest, uh, Benedetto Castelli, who was a Galileo student and his successor in, as a professor of mathematics at Pisa, was in fact present. The breakfast was held at the palace of the Medici, Galileo's employers, and the person there uh, of authority was the Dowager Duchess Christina, the mother of the reigning Duke Cosimo II of the Medici. She asked Castelli if Galileo's heliocentric ideas didn't conflict with the Bible, and she pointed to the story of Joshua making the sun stand still. So we learned, Castelli wrote, ran on home, um, wrote to Galileo, said, well, she wasn't really concerned about this, she was just curious, she was basically making conversation, and she was satisfied with the responses that Castelli had given her. Um, so Galileo wrote Castelli a letter in response, and then he expanded this into the letter that you read in 1615, his letter to the Dowager Grand Duchess Christina. Well, in that letter, Galileo argues that scripture has to be interpreted in the light of demonstrated scientific knowledge, and that its expressions are accommodated to the original audience. This is pure St. Augustine. It's straight out of St. Augustine's De Genese ad Literon, the literal commentary on Genesis. Um, but additionally, perhaps unwisely, Galileo provided his own reinterpretation of the Joshua passage. He argued that the literal meaning could be saved thanks to his discovery that the sun rotates on its axis. He noted that uh, the sun rotates in the same direction that all the planets revolve around the sun and so concluded that it may be the sun's rotation that causes the motion of the planets around the sun. He's actually picking this up from Johannes Kepler, a contemporary um, astronomer. So therefore, when scripture says that Joshua stopped the sun, it doesn't really mean that it stopped its motion across the sky. God's miraculously stopped its rotation. With its rotation stopped, 
the rest of the system shut down instantly, including the rotation of the Earth, making the sun seem to stand still in the sky and lengthening the day. St. Augustine would have been perfectly happy with this. He does much more than that in his literal commentary on Genesis. Um, but unfortunately, Galileo was not writing in the fifth century. He was writing in the early 17th, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, well, about a year later, on the fourth Sunday of Advent in 1614, <clears throat> the Dominican friar, Tommaso Caccini, preached a sermon at Santa Maria Novella in Florence. The Old Testament reading was the Joshua passage, and Caccini expounded it as was usual in his homily according to its allegorical and moral meaning. But at the end of the homily, quoting a line out of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 11, O men of Galilee, why stand you looking up into the heavens, which in Latin, O viri Galilei, which is a pun, it could be either O men of Galilee or men of Galileo, he took this opportunity to criticize Copernicus, mathematicians, and specifically Galileo and his followers. Well, some in attendance were insulted by this. They went to Caccini's superior and complained about it. And in fact, the Dominican superior wrote a letter of apology to Galileo in early January, 1615. So Galileo probably thought, okay, there's this minor friar by the name of Caccini who's got to be in his bonnet about something, but the prior of the Dominicans has given me apology. Um, in the Lessel article, some of that letter is quoted where the prior says, where the provincial says, um, yes, I'm constantly busy dealing with, uh, you know, 7,000 friars who inevitably are going to say something stupid every day. <laughs> um, send it to one of my friends who is a Dominican friar, and he found that very um, familiar to me. Um, all right, well, in 1615, in February, another Florentine Dominican, Niccolo Lorini, wrote a letter of complaint to the Inquisition. He forwarded a copy of Galileo's letter to Castelli, saying that it contained suspect ideas. So the Inquisition, extraordinarily uh, orderly in institution. Um, we have all the minutes of all the Inquisition documents dealing with Galileo. Most people who read it are struck by the rigid protocol, the rules of evidence, the due process, and the clarity that the Inquisition used. And in their usual efficient way, the Inquisition examined the complaint. Galileo's letter was found to have some bad expressions, that his word choices might be benign, but they sound bad. He had chosen the wrong word. For example, he says that Holy Scripture perverts certain things. But uh, the consultant found that there weren't any serious objections, and so said, yeah, the letter's fine. Now, interestingly enough, most of these bad expressions occur in the letter that uh, Lorini gave to the Inquisition, not in what we thought was Galileo's original. So for many, many years, historians of science have thought that Lorini sort of doctored the letter to make it sound more incriminating. However, amazing what you, one can actually still do, um, just two years ago, Galileo's original autographed letter to Caccini was discovered in London, where it had been unknown, stuck in the archives of the Royal Society of London for 250 years without it ever being cataloged or anyone knowing it was there. And in fact, now we know that um, the letter that Galileo sent had been doctored to make it seem less bad, and his original one is exactly what uh, Lonini sent in. So then the Inquisition summons Lorini, they question him, it's like, okay, what has Galileo done? He says, well, I don't really know, but I hear people talking. So they say, what do you hear talking? Well, there's a guy by the name of Caccini. Okay, go, send Caccini in. Caccini comes in, he makes accusations about Galileo. The Inquisition looks them up, says, this is all baseless, there's nothing. And when you read the minutes, the Inquisition minutes, they're published in a book called The Galileo Affair by uh, Maurice Finocchiaro. You can actually sort of see the Inquisitors rolling their eyes as Caccini gets more and more sort of ridiculous <laughs> and they get to the bottom of the case and they find it's all just hearsay and they dismiss the case. Well, they didn't dismiss all of it and here's the crux of the matter. There was one little piece. They decided that they have no expertise to examine the status of heliocentrism. 
So they have to outsource to someone who knows. They outsource to consultants to ask, okay, what is this heliocentrism business? Because they don't know. And in February the 24th, 1616, the consultants turn in the report and it's damning. Copernicanism is foolish and absurd in philosophy and heretical in theology. But then something unusual happens. The Inquisition gets the report and they put it aside. They pay no attention to it. They could have declared Copernicanism heretical at that point, but they didn't. Instead, they do too many much milder things. They turn to the office of the index, the body that's for examination of publications, and they ask them to review Copernicus's book. They come back that Copernicus's book is, quote, the terms are very important here, suspended until corrected, which means it can't be republished until certain corrections are made. Well, it took the index four years to bring out what the corrections were supposed to be, meaning that they didn't really care very much about it. When the corrections came out, they asked for 10 uh, uh, sentences in the, about 10 sentences in the book to be stricken. Um, none of them had anything to do with science. Every single one of them was about giving reinterpretations of the Bible. And very recently, I saw Galileo's copy of Copernicus, and he very dutifully went through and inked out all the lines that the index said should be inked out. It's on, it's on display in DC right now, actually. Um, the second action was that they asked Cardinal Roberto Bellarmino to meet with Galileo before the decree of the index came out to tell, hey, Galileo, this is coming out. The, the, the book is going to be suspended until corrected. The meeting happened in late February of 1616, and what exactly happened was later a matter of controversy. What we do know is Bellarmino probably told Galileo not to teach heliocentrism as proven and literally true. And Galileo agreed. Here we're at this, this instrumentalism, uh, uh, realism thing again. I'll come back to that in a moment. Well, Bellarmino, I think he's really the most interesting character. In 1615, he wrote to a Neapolitan priest named Paolo Antonio Foscarini. Foscarini had published a book reinterpreting the Bible to be compatible with Copernicanism, and he sent a copy of it to Bellarmino. Bellarmino praised Foscarini, and in the same letter, Galileo, for speaking, quote, suppositionally and not absolutely about their theories. And he goes on, I quote him here, there is no danger in saying that, by assuming the earth moves and the sun stands still, one saves all the appearances better than by postulating eccentrics and epicycles, that is the old system. And that's sufficient for the mathematician. However, it is different to want to affirm that in reality, the sun is really at the center of the world and the earth revolves with great speed around the sun. This is a dangerous thing. It is likely not only to irritate all philosophers and theologians, but also to harm the holy faith by rendering holy scripture false. But Bellarmino doesn't end there. He says, if there were an undeniable demonstration of the earth's motion, then scripture would have to be reinterpreted carefully in accord with this new discovery. But that, and I quote him again, I will not believe there is such a demonstration until it is shown to me. So here, Biblical interpretation seems to be a key issue, but it's not so straightforward. Galileo's letter to Christina, as you read, shows an exemplary understanding of Augustinian principles of biblical exegesis. Some it seems to be taken verbatim out of Augustine. Galileo cites Augustine on the unity of truth, the doctrine of accommodation, and uses a style of interpretation that the African doctor would have approved of. So as far as Galileo is concerned, his theological and exegetical principles are sound and orthodox. Um, now that leaves us a question. If Galileo is doing the right thing in terms of Augustinian exegesis, why was it a problem now? Well, this becomes even more interesting when we go back to the Middle Ages to see how many people there actually were who postulated heliocentrism and then reinterpreted scripture to fit it without anything ever happening. And the same thing is true with Copernicus. Remember, his book was published in 1543. It's not until 1616 that there's any problems about it. 
What's different about Galileo in his time? What's the local context that makes things diff different? Very simply, Protestantism. Um, the Protestant Reformation had thrown Catholicism into confusion, and the main cause for continuing schisms was the daily emergence of novel and often unlearned interpretations of scripture that undermined theological positions that had been agreed upon for centuries. And so the Council of Trent forbade reinterpretation of scripture in ways, quote, contrary to the consensus of the church fathers, the patristic writers, that is. So Galileo and Foscarini wrote in an atmosphere hypercharged with concern about non-standard biblical interpretations. And clearly both of them had violated, probably unintentionally, the Council of Trent's ruling. For no patristic writer would have ever thought of reinterpreting Joshua to uh, be about heliocentrism. Um, his letter to Christina also probably added fuel to the fire because he claimed that his, Galileo's, biblical interpretations were superior to the theologians. And at the same time, he does a very sort of arrogant thing, which is sort of in his personality, where he says, oh, well, you theologians, you just stay out of natural philosophy. I'm going to do that. But wait, I'm also going to reinterpret the Bible for you. So you can do my job, and I can do yours better. Um, so Bellarmino didn't rule out the possibility that scriptural interpretation would have to be amended in the light of new demonstrated truths, because he, like Galileo, knew Augustine. But he wanted a sound demonstration. And once that was found, then the proper authorities, not some mathematician from Florence, would move in to do the reinterpretation of the scripture officially. Okay, so what happened next? Less than a week after the decree of the index, Galileo went to see the Pope, Pope Paul V. Galileo, I should mention, remember, Galileo is not some schlemiel from the provinces, right? He's the head of philosopher to the Grand Duke of Tuscany. He's got relations with all the leaders of Tuscany and of the Papal States. He's familiar with the Pope as well. So he goes and sees the Pope, no problem. Um, he and the Pope talked for about 45 minutes, and the Pope said, yeah, Galileo, I know you've got some enemies, but you don't have to worry about anything as long as I live, I'll protect you. Fortunately, he died four years later, so that wasn't quite long enough. Um, Galileo heard rumors that he had been condemned, and so to defend his reputation, he went back to Rome. Remember, this is Italy, and so uh, the, it's a culture of honor and of reputation and of saving face, so this is extremely important to him. He goes to visit Bellarmino again and asks for a certificate, saying what actually had happened. Bellarmino said, sure, Galileo, no problem, gives him a certificate stating clearly that he had not abjured any doctrine, he had not been condemned or punished or given any um, uh, punishment. Uh, but it only been informed that he should not hold or defend Copernicanism as literally proven and true. That certificate will come back to haunt him a little bit later. So there's the end of Act One. Galileo goes back with his certificate, goes back to Florence with his certificate, um, and uh, he stays busy with other things. Any questions so far now that I've got to the end of this part? I'm going to go on to Act Two in just a second. Okay. Got you on your edge of your seats, what's going to happen? <laughs> so, for the following seven years, Galileo busied himself with other matters. But in August of 1623, right after the death of Pope Gregory the 15th, Galileo got what he thought was terrific news. His old friend, his admirer, Maffeo Barberini, had been elected the Pope and taken the name Urban VIII. At just that time, Galileo was finishing a book, Il Saggiatore, which dealt with a broad range of issues, and he took the opportunity to scratch out the dedication he had planned on and dedicate it instead to the new pope. Pope loved the book, um, and he, we know he was delighted with it. He read it quite thoroughly. In early 1624, after sending the book, Galileo visited Urban VIII. He was warmly received by his old friend. Maffeo Barberini had written poems in praise of Galileo, his fellow Florentine. Um, 
and had been one of Galileo's advocates back in 1616, who said that the decree of the index should have been stopped before it was ever issued. So, during the discussions, the Pope apparently gave Galileo the go-ahead to write about the Copernican hypothesis, provided two things. One, he did so in a hypothetical matter, that it's not absolutely proven, but here are the arguments in favor of it. And second, that he include a particular argument. This was Urban VIII's contention that since God is omnipotent, the determination of ultimate causes of visible effects can never be absolutely certain. That is, a given phenomenon could be generated by more than a single cause and still be identical to our eyes. Thus, while Galileo was certain and completely wrong that the tides were caused by the motion of the earth, the Pope was more cautious, arguing that the tides may very well have a different cause. So Galileo then began writing a dialogue which he titled, On the Tides. Um, in 1630, the manuscript was ready and then was sent off for publication. He wanted to print it at Rome under the auspices of the Lyncean Academy, the, which is one of the first international scientific societies. It was headed by his friend, uh, Prince Federico Cesi. He submitted it to review, as had to be done, to the Vatican censor for publication in Rome, Niccolo Riccardi. And after a few weeks, he got the imprimatur and the approval to go ahead with the printing. But then any number of problems happened everything short of a plague of locusts. Um, before the printing could start, Prince Chasey died. Without a patron, the Lynchian Academy collapsed. Then a plague broke out in central Italy that stopped commerce between Tuscany and Rome. So Galileo could not go to Rome, nor could he send his manuscript for a final check because both he and the manuscript would have been quarantined at the border of the Papal States. By 1631, so now a year later, Galileo lost patience and wanted it published in Florence instead. But new problems. It had been passed by the censor in Rome, but his authority did not transfer to Florence. So the summer of 1631 involved negotiations to transfer publishing authority to Florence. And in due course, the Vatican censor recorded the effect of transfer, sent along the list of alterations for Galileo to address. Now, one of these alterations in the manuscript was very interesting, and this alteration supposedly came from the Pope himself. Um, the title of the book was changed. Now, having published a number of books myself and had publishers change every single title I've ever come up with, um, this is not unusual, but the Pope thought it should not be called On the Tides and instead gave it the title Dialogue on the Two Chief World Systems. This was probably the nicest thing the Pope had ever done for Galileo because it moved Galileo's mistake about the tides out of the title and made the title what the book was really about, a comparison of Ptolemy's system versus Copernicus's. So the book was published in Florence, 1632. It received immediate praise from many corners, but rumors about it arose just as immediately. Most of all, Galileo heard that Urban VIII exploded in anger at him. He summoned the Tuscan ambassador to his uh, papal court and shouted, I have been deceived. What did that mean? Well, there are at least two injudicious moves on Galileo's part. The first deals with the way he dealt with the Pope's request to make that comment about um, how a given phenomenon may have multiple causes. So how's the book written? The book is a dialogue among three characters. One, Salviati, who speaks on, in favor of Copernicanism. Galileo's mouthpiece, in other words. His opponent, um, Sagredo, uh, his opponent speaks for Aristotelian physics and Ptolemaic astronomy and is named Simplicio. And the third, Sagredo, is the one who listens and asks questions, sort of the mediator. Now, the name Simplicio could be a reference to the 5th century Aristotelian commentator Simplicius, but any Italian reader would immediately see the pun in the name on words like simple and simpleton. And in fact, throughout the book, poor Simplicio is cast as a gibbering idiot. Um, in fact, if you read Galileo's dialogue, it's actually quite funny. You actually burst out laughing and reading because 
they constantly make fun of Suplicio. These, these, his ideas are made to seem just so ridiculous that it's hard even to mention them without laughing. So where do you think Galileo put the Pope's argument? On the very last page of the book and in the mouth of Suplicio. Urban's words from the mouth of a fool are greeted with a response that could easily be read as sarcastic. Oh, what a marvelous and angelic doctrine. And the book ends. Secondly, the Pope being angry now, uh, someone looked into the old Inquisition files and discovered that in 1616, Galileo had agreed not to defend the Copernican system. Well, Galileo had conveniently neglected to mention this fact to the Pope, who knew nothing about it. So it's clearly the Pope had a reason for saying he had been deceived. First, he's cast as a fool, and second, Galileo didn't give him the whole story. Look, Urban had supported and protected Galileo, given him the go-ahead to write, and this is the reward he got. Um, moreover, in 1632, this was the last thing that Urban VIII needed. He was having a very bad year. <laughs> he was under heavy criticism for his response, or rather his lack of response, to the Thirty Years' War, and there was a movement towards summoning a council to depose him. So put yourself in Urban's red shoes for a minute. You're under attack, your reputation, honor, and position in jeopardy, and now comes a, here comes along your old friend with what has every appearance of a deception, embarrasses you at a delicate, intense moment where your attention needs to be elsewhere. So instead of Urban the VIII sweeping in to help Galileo, which Galileo probably counted on, he let matters take their course and became intent on making an example out of Galileo. So, Galileo was summoned for questioning. He first pleaded his age, he was 68, and the difficulty of travel, but they said, no, gotta come to Rome. So he went to Rome in January of 1633. Now, there are often fictionalized accounts of Galileo being thrown into the inquisitorial dungeon. Um, no, in fact, he was very well treated. He was neither arrested nor imprisoned, and he stayed in the palace of the Tuscan ambassador. In April, he was summoned for questioning. Here, the inquisitors showed him a document from 1616 where Galileo agreed not to discuss Copernicanism in any way whatsoever. Well, Galileo was surprised, and he claimed that he was only given a warning by Bellarmino, and then he gave the inquisitors the certificate he had. And the inquisitors looked at the two of them and like, they're contradictory. Well, there's also something wrong with the certificate that the inquisitors had. It should have been signed by Bellarmino and Galileo, but it wasn't. So that's one of the mysteries. We don't know whether there was a sort of overzealous functionary that forged a document or maybe didn't write a complete document, but the two documents contradicted one another. And so the Inquisition said, well, we can't use either and threw them both out. Um, now the question came down to this. Did Galileo actually violate the agreement he had made with Bellarmino not to teach Copernicanism as absolutely true? So they actually took the words of the certificate that Galileo, the much milder one. <clears throat> so it became a very, very simple question. It wasn't about heliocentrism. It was in writing the dialogue, did, did Galileo violate his 1616 agreement with Bellarmino? So they asked Galileo, why didn't you mention this? He said, I didn't think it was important. Uh, and I quote, never imagined that my book would be read as defending heliocentrism. So he thought that Bellarmino's warning was irrelevant. He said, I don't really think heliocentrism is true. I was just playing around to make a weak argument look strong. And maybe I overdid it. Okay, it's a really big stretch to believe this from Galileo, but okay, that's what he said to the Inquisitors, and they were perfectly satisfied. So what they did was something that would become familiar to anyone um, today. They worked out a plea bargain. <laughs> Galileo would admit to having inadvertently broken his agreement, get a little slap on the wrist, and go back to Florence. So Galileo took a few days to come up with an honorable way of saying this, and finally, he came back to the Inquisition, said he, that he was, he reread his own book and he was really surprised because it did sound like I was 
defending geokinetic theory, even though I didn't even have that in mind. I just wrote too vividly, I got carried away in writing it, and I'm sorry I did this. He was just like, cool, that's all right. Um, that should have been the end of it. What would have happened then is the Inquisition sends the plea bargain to the Pope, the Pope rubber stamps it, all said and done. Unusually, the Pope refused to accept the plea bargain. The Pope demanded instead that Galilee had to be formally arrested, interrogated, and sentenced, he had to make a public abjuration, and his book had to be banned. So the far gentler measures that the Inquisition had worked out were thrown out. So in grim order, Galileo was arrested and formally interrogated on the 21st of June in 1633. He stuck to his story of never really holding Copernican ideas and was convicted of, this is again important legal terminology, vehement suspicion of heresy. There are three things that the Inquisition can, suspicion of heresy, vehement suspicion of heresy, and heresy. So he got in the middle. Um, and so the following day, he was read the sentence and recited a formal abjuration. He did not, regardless of romantic stories to the contrary, mutter under his breath, a poor si muove, and still it moves under his breath. Um, in, in everything, for uh, Galileo, he acted rather uncharacteristically for his personality, rather humbly. Well, there is one more oddity I should mention. Galileo's sentence should have been signed by all 10 inquisitors. However, three of them refused to sign it. Now, one was the head of the Spanish party that was trying to oust the Pope. So clearly, Galileo was seen as an enemy of the Pope, and the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But the other one, one of the others is much more interesting. Francesco Barberini, who's the Pope's nephew, the second most powerful man in Rome, also refused to sign it. Now, if you're familiar with, the, with semiotics and the way Italian court culture works in sending subtle signs that have to be interpreted, this is a classically Roman way of indicating quietly that the trial was really for show and that Urban didn't really endorse it. He had basically had his nephew not participate, not sign. So what happens to Galileo? He returns to the Tuscan embassy. Then he stays uh, for a few months with the Archbishop of Siena, one of his friends and supporters, and then retires to his villa at Arcetri outside of Florence, where he remained under house arrest for the rest of his life, um, where, in fact, he continued teaching students. Uh, he continued, um, I think the sentence was that, he had to remain under house arrest. He had to recite the penitential psalms once a week. Um, and, uh, but while there, he did much of his work that uh, set a new uh, system of kinematics for physics. Um, his, his book he was not supposed to publish, but he did write The Two New Sciences, which is on kinematics and the strength of beams, which somehow the manuscript got out of his hands and was published in the Netherlands. And, People no doubt ask, it's like, I don't know, I lent it to somebody and they sent it to be published. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So there's the story for you of, of Galileo and with all its complications. I hope you found that interesting and I can open up for questions. I thought we'd talk some more about the scientific revolution in general. Um, and I hope you gotten your copy of my, my little book here, which I hope you will enjoy. Um, it, was, uh, it was an interesting experience to write this, uh, since I was told to write it with 36,000 words and not a word more, and no footnotes, which is, these are, that's not the things you tell an academic professor, because uh, we love the footnotes where you can take back what you say in the rest of the text, <laughs> um, and hedge your bets. But anyway, um, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, right, so I, I think what I wanted to do for the, the, this next uh, session was to talk more broadly about the scientific revolution. So we've gotten into the scientific revolution with um, Galileo, and now I think part of the question is to think about what does the scientific revolution mean in its own context, and what does it mean for us? I think it's pretty clear that nowadays we live in a world that's governed 
primarily by science and technology. You all have your computers and your phones and everything else. It's hard to live nowadays without science and technology. Uh, the way we think about the world, think about the way that we describe ourselves and describe the world um, rhetorically. It's, it's molded by the outlooks and the metaphors and the insights that come to us from the sciences and technology. So the question is, how did this world come to be? Who crafted it? Who made it this way? When what does the state of affairs mean for philosophies and for religions that were expressed in terms of a different age? How, how, how do we have to change thinking about things? So many of the fundamental conceptions about the universe we inhabit, about the ways it functions and the ways in which we relate to it, date from what is sometimes considered the most transformational period in the history of science, and that is the scientific revolution. And at this point, at least when I'm teaching my younger students, it won't apply as much to this audience, um, is that we need to make sure we're on the same page of when the scientific revolution took place. Because when I mentioned to my students the scientific revolution, the early modern, the early modern period, they think I'm talking about the 1980s. <laughs> Which, if that's true, it means I was born in the high Middle Ages. Which, the longer I live, the more I think, oh, it's a shame I wasn't. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, when historians of science talk about the scientific revolution, we're referring to the 16th and 17th centuries. So many of the most famous historical scientists lived in that period. So we've already mentioned Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, but also Descartes, Harvey with the circulation of the blood, Robert Boyle, Isaac Newton, and so forth. And that's just a few of them. So the, the period's major reconceptualizations of the, um, uh, uh, that date from that time, are they're really too numerous to list an Earth-centered cosmos replacing a Sun-centered one, the Moon and the planets being found to be made out of the same stuff as the Earth, the regular motions of the heavenly bodies are explained, foundations of classical physics established, the circulation of the blood demonstrated, the first scientific societies and academies were established, the new world discovered, and new regions of the old world explored. Mechanical technological metaphors replaced more organic ones, and the time when human beings began reconceptualizing where, where do we actually stand in this cosmos of ours. Right, so those developments are pretty well agreed upon, but there are other rather less reliable claims, um, particularly those relating to my central theme, that is the relationship of science and religion, have also been made. Um, and chief among those, is the assertion that it was during the scientific revolution that the further and more rapid development of scientific knowledge was what brought faith and reason into conflict, and that conflict has simply continued and intensified down to the present day as science progressively displaces or replaces religion. So the scientific revolution is seen by some people as a turning point for both science and religion positive one for science, a negative one for religion. But I'll argue, I'll try to show now, that this claim is based on a number of falsehoods, and actually uh, it draws its, its um, origins not from the 17th century, but from retrospective assertions that I talked about yesterday, those motivated by social, political, and personal aims of the late 19th century. So I want to look at the claims and their origins in order to understand the scientific revolution and its role in the science-religion dynamic more accurately. So I'm going to look at three claims that are sometimes made about the scientific revolution in, in, in turn. The first is that the crafters of the scientific revolution were themselves non-religious or somehow irreligious. So our major scientific characters in the 16th, 17th century um, had, sort of had it in for religion or ignored religion, uh, paid no attention to it. Number two, uh, that religion and faith played either a negative and adversarial role or no significant role in the scientific re re revolution and by extension afterwards as well. 
And the third claim is, this is the one that's sort of most interesting, and this is the one that one hears most frequently. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit today, but I'm gonna talk about it much more tomorrow, that the relationship between science and religion is a zero-sum game. That is, as one advances, the other must necessarily retreat. All right, so I'm gonna go through those three. Um, there's a lot to say about each one of them, but let's start at the beginning, that the crafters of the scientific revolution were non-religious or irreligious. So I'll start out by saying that even though we hear this a lot in popular treatments, that kind of statement um, for historians of science, it's so absurd as to be beneath our notice. So maybe it shouldn't be, maybe we need to talk about it a little more, and I know some people are doing that, which is a good thing. Um, it's, uh, we find it among a lot of popular writers and a fair number of scientists um, who, not to be too rude about it, um, imagine that they have the competence to make historical claims without being historians. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, my, the, the course that I did on science, on, I don't remember which one it was. Was I guess it was the science and religion course that I did for the teaching company. Um, it, it got into the hands of a student who wrote to me, a student from California, as I recall, and he wrote to me in a, almost a panic. It was a crisis for him because, as he wrote to me, he discovered that the people whom he had been taught to see as heroes of the sciences and heroes of the modern world were actually, God forbid, religious. <laughs> <laughs> and the way he described it to me, it was actually a crisis of faith. Those were those exact, the, the kinds of language he used to write to me about this it was just like someone whose religious faith had been shaken by some event. But in this case, his faith sort of in the religion of science, let's say, the, the, the way science develops had been shaken. And he was really upset. He was really literally upset by this. He had to write to me to talk about it. So that's, a, that's an interesting and a kind of strange thing that happens. Um, all right. Well, the evidence to the contrary of that crafters of the scientific revolution were non-religious is overwhelming. So I'll just give you a few examples. Let's look at one of my old friends, Robert Boyle, um, Anglo-Irish uh, uh, scientist of the 17th century. Those of you who've taken some chemistry will remember Boyle's Law. Um, he was a champion of chemistry, discovered that fundamental gas law that bears his name, one of them. Um, and in his eulogy, he was called a lay bishop, and his many books divide evenly between scientific and theological topics. In fact, for his entire life, he's, in a sense, alternated writing scientific and writing theological treatises. His most popular work was a devotional treatise about the love of God. Uh, he funded uh, missions, uh, he funded translations of the Bible into Malay and into the Iroquois language, um, and uh, he gave a large amount of money. He was very rich, he was the son of the richest man in, in Britain, a um, uh, youngest son, which he was very thankful for because it mean, meant he didn't have to marry and carry on the family line or manage the estates, and so he became scientist instead. Um, who else have I got? We've got Isaac Newton. I don't have a picture of Newton. You know what Newton looks like. Um, <laughs> he devoted at least as much time to theology, Christology, and biblical studies as he did to mathematics and physics. The general scolium in a later edition of his famous Principia Mathematica, the book that sets the foundations for celestial mechanics based on his notion of universal gravitation, is all about theological speculations about what God is like. And there he firmly states that, quote, to discourse of God from the appearances of things does certainly belong to natural philosophy. His last work, um, 
po published posthumously, the chronology of ancient kingdoms amended, endeavored to get more reliable dates for the reigns of ancient monarchs and ancient events. Why? Well, it was part, in part, in large part, to fix biblical events more accurately in the historical past in order, in turn, to calculate dates better for the fulfillment of future prophecies, such as the end of the world and the last judgment. And it's trivially easy to cite a long list of scientific work and achievements carried out by people in holy orders. In the middle of the 17th century, uh, the French priest Pierre Gassendi revived Epicurus's ideas about atomism. And in the memorable phrase of the late historian of science, Margaret Osler, he baptized these pagan ideas in ways that make them acceptable to Christians. So Epicurus had said everything, all change comes about from the random association, dissociations of eternal and eternally moving atoms. Uh, what Gassendi just said is that God created the atoms and gave them motion. <laughs> and that, okay, fine, no problem. Um, the, he also was the first person to observe a transit of the planet Mercury across the face of the sun, which he did in 1633. That was predicted that it would happen by Kepler, Johannes Kepler, I'll talk about Kepler in a minute. Uh, Kepler died before 1633, so was unable to see it, but Gassendi was the person perhaps probably the only person who, who saw it in 1633. He was actually surprised. Um, he had a, a, um, an assistant who was beating time with a pendulum to find out when it first entered the solar disk. And he kept thinking, it's not happening, it's not happening. All I see is this sunspot. And then he realized that the sunspot was moving and so discovered that the planet's Planet Mercury is vastly smaller than people thought it would be. Because really, I actually have seen a transit of Mercury myself copying Gassendi, and it just does look, it looks like a very small sunspot crossing the sun. So he did discover that. Um, he also tried to replicate some of Galileo's experiments. Now, Galileo said that, you know, if you drop a rock from the top of a mast on a moving ship, it's going to drop at the bottom of the mask, not at the back of the ship. And people tried to do this. It was difficult because the ship kept rocking. Gassendi instead have pe had people galloping on horses, throwing balls to each other to see whether they could actually, if some of the two people are galloping on their horses as fast as they can, can they actually throw a ball and it will maintain the forward motion. Again, it was also, I'm got with galloping horses, it didn't work really, really well, but um, <laughs> um, he tried. The foundational principles of geology and stratigraphy were enunciated, and the true nature of fossils as the relics of ancient living creatures demonstrated by Neil Stenson, I give you his Latinized name, Nicholas Steno here. Uh, Steno is a very interesting character. He was born in 1638 in Denmark, he was raised as a Lutheran, uh, he studied anatomy and did a sort of grand tour of Europe. He was in Paris for a while. Ended up in the Medici court in, uh, in Florence um, and there converted to Catholicism, uh, became a priest, uh, was made a bishop, and by the way, is now a Beatus. So he needs one more miracle. Um, actually, I visited his, um, uh, his relics. Uh, they have now been moved from the crypt up into a chapel in the Church of San Lorenzo in, in Florence. So you can visit him there, the Blessed Steno. Um, during his extensive work as an anatomist, he had evidently had very good with a scalpel, very careful. He discovered the salivary duct, which to this day is called Stenson's duct after him. Uh, also discovered uh, various parts of circulation of fluids in the body. Very interesting character. Um, a list of 17th century Jesuits reads like a roster of significant scientific discoverers. Um, I'll mention first Giovanni Battista Riccioli. Um, he measured quite accurately the constant of gravitational acceleration by dropping weights from the leaning tower of Bologna. 
Now, it's sometimes said that Galileo did this in Pisa. He didn't. What it's a conflation with is Riccioli doing it from the towers in Bologna. Um, now, the one problem he had is he had to drop the weights from this tower and time their descent very, very accurately. Well, you don't have very accurate clocks in the 1650s. So instead, he tried to make a, a, a unit, it's called a unit pendulum, that would be once a second. Well, what's the only accurate timekeeping device you have? It's the sun, that how long it will take the sun to cross the meridian to the next day when it crosses the meridian again. So what he had <laughs> the Jesuit novices do is he made, he, he got the closest he could, and he made the Jesuit novices sit there and count its beats from noon one day until noon the next day. <laughs> and then he would make the string a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, and he had to do it again <laughs> until he got to a one second pendulum that was accurate enough. Um, unfortunately, after several days, the novices revolted and said, no, we are not doing this anymore. And so instead, what he had the novices do is they stood at the bottom of the, the tower and they chanted very rapidly. And then they counted which syllable the ball would pass different marks on the, on the, um, on the tower. And he got a pretty good of value for the acceleration of gravity that way. Um, he also mapped the moon telescopically. So if you go and look at a map of the moon as it still is used today, you will find there are an extraordinarily large number of craters named after Jesuits. <laughs> um, and he gave them their names, the names that we use for craters. Um, um, and the Maria are the ones that Riccioli gave them. I should also say that Riccioli wrote a huge book um, I used it at the beginning, let me go back. That's its frontispiece, um, trying to determine the true system of the world like Galileo had done. And what he's got here depicted are the three systems of the world. Here's Ptolemy. It's lying on the ground because Ptolemy's definitely wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's thrown away. And here you have the two systems. Here you have Copernicus and here you have Tycho Brahe. So sun-centered, uh, Earth-centered, but with Tycho, all the other planets are going around the sun while the sun goes around the Earth. And Riccioli listed all the arguments in favor of one or the other. Now, because of what happened with Galileo, um, a Jesuit was not allowed to support Copernicus. That was forbidden. Um, but he seems honestly, I think, although I'm not entirely sure, to have uh, argued for in favor of the Tychonian system. He realized that there would be such a thing as the Coriolis effect. That is, if you have, um, if, you have a, if you have, as he put it, if you have a cannon at the equator, the cannon, if the, if the Earth is rotating, would be moving at about 1,000 miles an hour east to west. And so if you shoot a cannonball north, the velocity of the Earth, because the Earth is spherical, is going to be less the farther, farther north you go, and at the North Pole it's zero. So therefore, that ball should divert from a north-south course as it goes north. So that's the Coriolis effect. He actually tried to measure the Coriolis effect with cannons um, and could not, and said, well, it doesn't exist. Therefore, there's another uh, reason why Copernicus must be wrong. Of course, the Coriolis effect is too small to be detected by firing cannons, um, but he made the attempt after all. Now, there is one thing about this that has always puzzled me, and this is, this is purely hypothetical, I'll speak suppositionally like Galileo. If you see what he's done here, right, he has these two systems in a balance, and the Tychonian system as he says in words, is weightier. It, it seems to carry more weight, and so it's lower. However, think about what else you've seen for things like this. Anybody who's looking at that in the early modern period would immediately think of images of the Last Judgment, where souls are being weighed, and it's the light soul that's the saved one 
The heavy one is the damned soul. And so is this sort of like we do with footnotes, saying one thing and then taking it back somewhere else. It's not really clear. Um, as a result, we find a lot of Jesuits say, you know, as late as the eight, middle of the 18th century, before the ban on Copernicanism is lifted in the 18th century, going on and on saying, Copernicus explains this, 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 and this, it's really great. Oh, but we can't hold that, so we'll take Tico. Um, and, and that will go on for a while. Um, another one of my favorites, that I think is, he is my favorite. Uh, oh, we've got one more person before I get to my favorite. Um, uh, Francesco Maria Grimaldi, another Jesuit, uh, was the first person to observe and describe diffraction, uh, a phenomenon that was satisfactory, they explained, only in the 20th century, the diffraction of light passing through a slit or past a sharp object like by inside of a pin. Um, and it's only recently been discovered that the Jesuits were the very first people in Europe to teach Galileo's new science of motion in their Roman college. They're already doing this in, in the 1640s. Um, the, um, oh, I think I've missed my favorite person, so I'll have to have to leave it. Yeah, Athanasius Kircher, um, a Jesuit who, um, let's see, did I miss a page? Ah, right. Um, in 1638, uh, for the first time in several hundred years, Mount Vesuvius erupted. Uh, Kircher had been in Sicily during an earthquake that happened just before the eruption started, and he was so fascinated by this, he actually descended into the crater of Vesuvius while the eruption was going on in order to make observations. Now, I know it didn't happen this way, but I think of Kircher with his Beretta <laughs> on the end of ropes being lowered down into the crater. It's like, okay, pull me up now. Um, <laughs> um, what he concluded was that there was so much fire and molten rock being extruded from the volcano that the old idea that the interior of the mountain was on fire could not possibly account for that much. And so he concluded that the Earth's center, the Earth's core must be molten. And this was a vent to subterranean fires and subterranean uh, lava. Um, he also later organized a museum of natural and mechanical wonders in Rome. And he came very close, didn't succeed, but came close to cracking the secret of how to read Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, so the topics of magnetism and of optics and of seismology were at various times virtually Jesuit monopolies. And by 1700, over half, over half of the university chairs in mathematics were occupied by Jesuits. So um, I mentioned Galileo just very briefly about the Jesuits teaching him. It bears mention, since I didn't say this before, that he did remain Catholic to the end of his life. Uh, in fact, we now know, this was very recently discovered in the records of uh, Florence, that he was actually tonsured in 1630, so he must have taken a very low level of holy orders, probably in order to get a benefice of some sort or other. But um, we do know that this was, this was the case. Okay, so um, any questions about these guys so far? Yeah. Are you familiar with the, the text Galileo's Daughter? Yes, yes, by Davis Sobel. Speak for folks in the room. Yeah, um, Davis Sobel, who, who is one of the, I think, good popularists of the history of science, wrote a book based on the letters that exist between Galileo's daughter and her father. Um, it's a book called Galileo's Daughter. She was a nun um, in the convent, in a convent in a, an illegitimate daughter, because Galileo never married. He actually had two daughters and a son. Wedlock. Uh, she was a nun in a convent in um, Florence, and so often Galileo got permission to come out from house arrest, go visit his daughter. His daughter visited him, and so um, it's a very interesting book. It, it was well written with good scholarship, I think. All right. So now let's. Anyone else? Anything else? Yeah. I'm just curious to know if your student had some kind of a conversion experience after all of this. I don't know. I sort of 
said, well, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of sorry. This is uh, this is a historical reality. I guess you have to you have to deal with it. So I didn't hear from. I only heard from him twice in, in response to that. So I don't know. Maybe he's gone off and gone to seminary or something. <laughs> um, all right. So yeah. So so, so I mean, uh, you're aware of Stalyaki. He, he was a faculty member here in the Department of Physics mm -hmm. for many years. So he wrote, of course, a bunch of books, but he wrote The Savior of Science. So, so I mean, is that mainstream? I, I know it was very controversial that, that, um, that without Christianity or, or Catholicism, there wouldn't be uh, modern science? Um, yeah, I know it is controversial. Uh, and, and it's still controversial among uh, a number of people. But I do think there is something to be said in general for the thesis. Um, I think, for example, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow, but um, yeah, there, there are certain things about monotheism, certainly, that promotes the idea of an orderly world that you wouldn't have in a sort of pantheon of squabbling gods. There is also something about Christianity in particular, where the world is good but is not God, that plays an important role. And I think also, in particular, about Catholicism that um, has such a positive view of materiality, of the human body, of, of materials, that the sacraments are based in matter, that God works through material things. And I, I do frankly think that that's, that's a crucial point. We don't see the same thing, for example, happening in Islam that does have a monotheistic, omnipotent God, but does not have the same level of um, admiration let's say, uh, for uh, the material world. And I think that's because there is not an incarnation, right. personally. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit yeah, we'll about this tomorrow. Yeah. Hi, what, sorry. Yeah. Um, this is something that I've seen preparing for class and tried to find out more about. Um, are there not instruments from Islamic scientists and civilization that helped with Copernicus and Galileo. And I think some of them are in the city at the Met, because I've been able to show pictures of them to my students, but I need to learn more about this. So yeah. in some ways, it's like these, these different religions that build upon each other and towards science. So there's kind of more less divisions. Absolutely. The, 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 the role of Arabic science is crucial, um, certainly in the Renaissance of the 12th century but also continuing on for centuries after that. Certainly instruments, the astrolabe, which is originally a Greek invention, but is perfected in the right. Islamic world. Um, and people have been looking for years for a smoking gun that connects Copernicus with uh, the Islamic astronomers in Central Asia, because a number of the mathematical techniques that Copernicus uses are identical to some mathematical techniques that are worked out in Samarkand. Mm. Um, but no one's ever been able to find a wow. really clear link. The argument is, okay, Copernicus was in Ferrara as a student, and he was living in a house of a person who knew the Arabic materials, so did they have a conversation over dinner about? We, we just don't know, but we don't have really clear evidence possible. Okay, so let's move on to the second fallacy that religion and faith play either no role or a negative and adversarial role in the scientific revolution. Um, well, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, religion, theology, and the churches, particularly the Catholic Church, supported and encouraged the study of the natural world in multiple ways. So the first place, and this often shocks my students when I tell them this, is that one of the primary motivations for the study of the natural world was a religious and devotional imperative. Those who studied the natural world in the scientific revolution saw their research as the study of God at one remove. That is, by studying the created works of God, they believed that they were revealing God's thoughts. They were revealing lines in the blueprint by which he created the universe. And this outlook follows the concept of the two books enunciated by the patristic authors, particularly St. Augustine, which holds that God reveals himself. God is all about revealing himself 
to his creation, and that he does so in more than one way. One, by inspiring the sacred writers to pen the scriptures, and, but also by the very act of creating the world that is the book of nature, book of scripture, book of nature. The scientists of the scientific revolution sought to read the book of nature to learn not only about nature itself, but to see through it to its creator. The universe was to them in this sense, a kind of first incarnation, a first revelation of God to um, existence. Um, Galileo himself taps into this idea when he writes about what he calls, I quote him here, that great book which is ever open before our eyes, I mean the universe. And Galileo says it is written in the figures of geometry. And the, its letters are circles and triangles and lines, language of mathematics. So we have to remember that all the thinkers of the scientific revolution had a much broader vision than most not all, but most modern scientists, they looked out on a deeply interrelated cosmos with meaningful relationships everywhere among human beings, the natural world, and God. If you read my little book, you'll see that's one of the things I really emphasize, and I'm gonna come back to it in tomorrow in the lecture. So for some examples, how about Galileo's contemporary, with great mustache, um, uh, Johannes Kepler, uh, the astronomer, he enunciated the three fundamental laws of planetary motion. Um, he was the one who convincingly determined that the, um, threw away 2,000 years of uh, uh, astronomical ideas that the planets must move in perfect circles because the universe is perfect, and realized that they actually move in ellipses. In fact, he wrote the only book, a very lengthy book, of the new astronomy in 1609, where <coughs> nine-tenths of the book is about all his calculations that didn't work until he finally gets to the last one. And the reason he writes it this way is that everybody since the time of Plato had been trying to reduce planetary motions to combinations of uniform circular motion. And Kepler keeps trying to do this. He does everything possible and finally he says, look, basically, they look, guys, I've done everything. The only thing that's left is an ellipse with the sun at one of the foci. That's the only thing that works. Anyway, he once lamented to his teacher, quote, I wanted to be a theologian and was sad for a long time about that. Apparently his grades weren't quite good enough to get into theological school. But he concluded, quote, now I see how God is praised just as well by my work in astronomy. So you can see that these natural philosophers, which we should call them rather than scientists, since that's neologism, um, saw these two things as closely related. In other words, his scientific work was in fact theological and religious. Robert Boyle, whom I mentioned at the beginning, thought it was particularly appropriate to do chemical experiments on Sundays. <laughs> because they were a kind of worship. <laughs> now, I'll note to you that this viewpoint stretches across all the main Christian denominations of the day, because I've just cited a Catholic, a Lutheran, and an Anglican. Others thought that scientific findings might be useful in practical theological matters. The Minim priest, Marin Marcel, studied what is called the mechanical philosophy, a worldview that holds that the functioning of the universe is like that of a great machine, regular and predictable. Why? Because he hoped that learning nature's regular laws, if everything works mechanically, everything would be predictable, and therefore it would help solve the problem of the discernment of miracles. In other words, you could figure out what is supposed to happen in nature, and if something is out of line with that, then you can say, aha, that's a miracle. To return to a moment to, for a moment to Kepler, he used his mathematical and geometrical expertise to argue that Luther's doctrine of the consubstantiation of the Eucharist could not possibly be true and that either the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation or the Calvinist symbolic view had to be correct. Now he was a Lutheran and for his efforts, he was excommunicated from the Lutheran church. 
Um, having mentioned the churches, um, they also fostered scientific studies, and particularly the Catholic Church as an institution. Most obviously, it was the church that established and funded universities, which had grown out of the schools founded at cathedrals. Um, the support given to those in holy orders, particularly among the Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Jesuits, the Benedictines, and the other orders, as well as countless abbeys, not only in terms of housing and sustenance, but in terms of freeing them from time-consuming and distracting familial responsibilities, let them, freed them to do the kind of scientific work uh, for which they later became famous. I should also know, mention, it's noteworthy how many scientific revolution figures not in holy orders also remained bachelors. So likewise, the orders built the first global networks of correspondence and exchange. New scientific information and materials flowed back to Rome through far-flung Jesuit missionaries in Asia, Africa, and the Americas. They take as an example the Franciscans in the New World who preserved the knowledge of indigenous peoples and transmitted much of their knowledge about local flora and fauna uh, back to Europe. Um, several historians of science, including Richard Westfall and um, um, I'm having a name problem as I get older. Um, wrote Son in the Church. Harry Ford. Well, it'll come to me in a moment. I can't remember his name. Um, have argued that until the era of large scale government funded research in the 20th century, the Catholic Church was easily the greatest patron of the arts and the sciences. Well, I think that all is enough to indicate that the crafters of the scientific revolution were themselves religious and were often motivated towards the study of the natural world by devotional and religious imperatives. Um, in this and other ways, religion and religious institutions fostered the discoveries and environment for making such discoveries. Um, what we're left with is the last thing, that is the zero-sum game, that as science advances, religion must retreat. Um, well, it does, I must say, often look to us today like science is successively replacing religion as an explanation of our world. Uh, but I think we need to look more closely to ask whether or not this is merely apparent or whether, this whether it's actually true. Is it based on the very character of science and religion themselves? Um, I think the answer to that question is no. So why does it seem to be true? Why do people say this as often as they do? And here I'm going to point to a specific subset of theology, um, and I would say bad theology, that I think is to blame. And this bad theology is itself a product of the scientific revolution, and so needs to be part of our considerations here. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this when I talk about natural theology tomorrow. But what I'm referring to is ultimately what has come to be called the God of the gaps problem. <coughs> Namely, the consequence that when divine direct, divine, excuse me, when direct divine action is used to fill in gaps in our explanations of natural events. That's what we call God of the God. You know, we don't understand why something is happening. God does it. The problem is that in most cases, the resort to God's direct action is a consequence of our limited knowledge. And therefore, as scientific understanding increases, the gaps become filled with natural explanations. And so God, hence religion, gets successively squeezed out. The origin of the God of the Gaps argument it's itself, as I've said, lies in the scientific revolution when scientific discoveries and knowledge were first deployed as a bulwark for religion. The problem is that our scientific knowledge is almost always provisional and subject to revision. Therefore, arguments for religion based on scientific ideas that become outdated themselves then become outdated. In other words, as the science becomes outdated, if we ally divine action too tightly to it, then that divine action itself becomes outdated along with it. So let me give you an example. The classic example comes from Isaac Newton. He observed that the orbital velocities of Jupiter and Saturn were changing 
he, he measured them himself, he measured, looked at other people's measurements. One was slowing down and one was speeding up. So he realized that if this went on for too long, as long as the universities had existed, the system would no longer be stable. The system would become unstable. The solar system would fall apart in chaos. Therefore, he suggested that God must intervene from time to time to set the system right. Now, that's a big problem on two fronts. Not only, first of all, this argument makes God seem to be incompetent and that he couldn't possibly put together a system that would keep running. It also makes, it also um, is a problem because 70 years later, the French astronomer Simon Laplace discovers how the system corrects itself over time. This is what astronomers now know as secular variation. For several centuries, one planet of Jupiter and Saturn speeds up and the other slows down, and then after a couple of centuries, it reverses. And this is because of the gravitational effect they have on each other. So look, if you took Newton's excuse, God had one fewer thing to do. Um, and, the same, and the same issue bedevils the so-called argument from design. Another development of the late 17th century, namely that complex structures like the eye and the hand had to have a direct designer, i.e. God, and therefore the existence of the hand and the eye prove God's existence. But these multiple arguments from design built up from the 17th to the 19th century were undermined by the discovery of evolution and natural selection. Again, God had less to do, religion to pick the wrong horse, and so a natural extrapolation would be that God is unnecessary and religion always gets it wrong. Of course, that ignores the fact that many of the gaps from which God was squeezed out were actually closed, not by anti-religious people, but by religious believers themselves. Um, the priest George Lemaitre, we mentioned yesterday for Big Bang Cosmology, um, the monk Gregor Mendel for genetics that gave a mechanism for evolution, or gave the foundations for evolution's uh, mechanism. The point I'm trying to make is that the God of the Gaps argument was a bad move from the beginning. Not only was it a bad move, it was an unnecessary move. It set things up to fail. And it was, again, I'll talk about this more tomorrow, it was in large measure a move by English Protestants to combat what they believed to be a rising tide of atheism. In the late 17th century, the English were freaked out by the idea of atheism. They saw atheists behind every bush and every stone, <laughs> sort of like panic seeing terrorists or whatever behind everything today. Uh, they were so concerned about this, in part because the English crown had been set up to be Anglican. And if you start taking away the foundations of Anglicanism, you take away the foundations for the restoration of the English monarchy. So they actually started using scientific principles to um, um, support religion for political and social reasons, and also out of this paranoia about atheism. Now, in fact, if you get down to it, no one could ever point at a single atheist in the late 17th century, maybe Thomas Hobbes. Okay? Hobbes was considered, they called him the monster of Malmesbury because he was supposedly an atheist. Was he really an atheist? We don't know. Okay? But there was this panic in England and this comes out of it. Now, please don't get me wrong. I believe that wonder at the natural world can certainly intensify devotion in a believer and urge believers onward towards discovering more about that world. And that is in fact the way science and religion worked together without a God of the gaps kind of argument. You see, the problem is when it becomes a theological argument rather than a theological um, kind of devotion or an emotional appeal. When it's a theological argument, it's a very weak one as the God of the gaps problem shows. And as I say, 
I can talk about this in the question session, but I can talk much more about it tomorrow. So let me get back to my initial question. Um, the zero-sum game. The advance of science paired with the retreat of religion. It needn't be so, because the insertion of divine explanation and divine activity into, into explanations of the natural world was, as I say, a bad move from the start, and any medieval theologian would have told us that. Um, much of what is perceived today as a conflict between science and religion stems from the errors in the assignment of causation, generally linked to what I call bad theology and bad exegesis. Much more about causation tomorrow, because I think in many cases, that it, this is the crux of the science religion issue. That when you put a bad theology, a weak theology, along with a weak principles of exegesis, you get to explanations of causation that just can't stand either the test of time or of rigorous philosophical analysis. So that's because tomorrow is our philosophical day. Um, in the meantime, think about the fundamentalist insistence on special creation, that is the creation of each species independently instead of evolution or a young earth created in a short period rather than an ancient earth and universe. And what we've now seen, a, 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 a book has recently published by a friend and colleague of mine, Ivano da Prete, um, on the idea of the ancient earth. And so we often hear this bit about the earth being thought to be 6,000 years old, um, that it was created on a specific date in, 16, in, in six, was it 404 BC in October, I think on a Tuesday. Um, <laughs> that's a number that it was come up with by um, uh, Archbishop Usher, the Anglican bishop uh, in Ireland. Um, but that's in the, in the early 17th century. Um, but um, uh, it, it, my, my friend's book shows that before that time, particularly in Southern Europe, the idea of an ancient earth, a very, very old earth, maybe even an eternal earth, um, was never seen as being in conflict with Genesis at all. Um, and that this conflict with Genesis only comes of when you get bad exegesis, in other words, literal interpretations of scripture. So it's no surprise that this exact date comes from an Anglican bishop in Ireland. Um, now, that's not to say that um, he was not Irish, he was English. I have to be careful. I speak a lot in Ireland. I have to be very careful about saying what goes on in Ireland in the 17th century because it's not the Irish that are doing it. Um, right. So at any rate, um, uh, there's a great interest in chronology. I'll, I'll, I have a couple of minutes left. Um, there's a great interest in chronology in the late 16th and early 17th century. And Usher is one of multiple people who tries to work out this chronology. It's why Newton was trying to do biblical chronology as well in the beginning of the 18th century to work out timelines for what's happening. Um, and Usher's number of 1404 BC just becomes popular because a printer sticks it into the margin of the King James translation of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You look in the margin, 404, 4004 BC, uh, but there were actually lots of different numbers that came up at that point. Um, I should also say, those of you familiar with the Christmas proclamation that's read on the vigil, um, when did that actually become part of the Catholic liturgy? 1585, the same time the calendar is being reformed and chronology, people are getting really interested in chronology. And some of you may be aware that um, it's not Usher's number, it's a, it's a much older number um, for the date of the creation, which comes out of different sources, but many of you may be aware that in the 1990s it was actually updated so that instead of giving a date, it now says, um, if I can quote it exactly, when ages beyond number had, had uh, run their course, the earth was created, da, da, da. So look at the two, it's very interesting how chronology fits in with our ideas of um, biblical interpretation and science. Anyway, so, um, 
So uh, with the young earth or, or individual creations rather than evolution, a kind of naive biblical literalism plays a big role. And the origins of that kind of exegesis date also from the scientific revolution. Our medieval theologians would not have made either mistake. They saw calling in divine action to explain natural phenomena as an intellectual cop-out. It was not a legitimate move. It meant you had given up trying to find naturalistic causes. And in so doing, those medieval theologians defined a method of what is now known as methodological naturalism that is central to modern science. That is, when you're trying to explain something that's happening in the natural world, the only legitimate answers are natural causation or I don't know. Calling in God for that, uh, for the medieval uh, people, for medieval uh, writers was, as I say, a cop out. It was a shortcut and they didn't do it. And again, I'll talk about more of that later. They also know how to interpret the Bible following the guidelines of St. Augustine. But both of these techniques were eroded and finally discarded, particularly in Northern Europe, towards the end of the scientific revolution. So I think it's right to say that while science and Christianity were not in conflict during the scientific revolution, and that scientific the thinkers of the period were themselves religious believers, and that the churches supported science, it is also the case that some of the developments that would later unnecessarily bring science and Christianity into conflict, I refer to the erosion of methodological naturalism and informed biblical exegesis, also draw their origins from the same period. And of course, these twin problems became far worse in the early 20th century with the rise of American fundamentalism, but that's a different story that I don't have time to discuss today. So anyway, I hope that in conclusion, I've given you some things to think about, about contextualizing the scientific revolution and some of the characters that did their work there. So thank you, I look forward to your questions.